Thank you for joining us for our webinar on IP enforcement issues to consider in the UK after the end of the transition period for the UK's exit from the EU. I'm Kirsten Gilbert, and this is one of my partners, Gina Lodge. Together, Gina and I head up the trademark and brand protection team at Marks & Clark Law, based in London. We wanted to think about some of the changes that will occur as a result of the Brexit transition period coming to an end. And we thought a helpful way to do this would be by walking through a relatively straightforward trademark infringement scenario. So to introduce the scenario, I will hand over to Gina. Right, so as Kirsten said, rather than just reciting what the new landscape is going to look like in the UK, we thought it'd be more interesting if we considered how an infringement scenario might be dealt with after the 1st of January. The scenario set out on the slide therefore touches on a number of the key changes we expect to see after the 1st of January. So the scenario is as follows. Blue Toys GmbH, a German company, makes fizzle slime. They have an EUTM for fizzle in class 28, which was filed in May 16. The mark's been widely used in the EU 27, but the UK is a new market for 2021. In March 2021, Blue Toys discovers that Green Toys SA, a French company, is selling Dizzle Putty in the UK and in the EU27. Their investigations reveal that the infringement commenced in 2020, and they also show the path of entry into the European market. So Dizzle is manufactured in China, comes into the Netherlands, and from there onwards into the other EU uh, countries and also into England. And there's also a direct path of entry from China into England. So the points arising out of this scenario that we propose to cover include, firstly, how Blue Toys might become aware of the infringement in the UK, what rights Blue Toys might have to assert in the UK after IP completion day, and by that we mean obviously the 1st of January 2021. To the extent those rights include comparable UK marks, how the position on use and reputation will be affected, We'll consider the need to take separate action in the UK and EU and how that might provide opportunities for forum shopping. We'll think about how the fact that the infringement bridges the EU and post-EU world in the UK, how this might be dealt with by the UK courts. Finally, we'll conclude with thinking about how English proceedings will be served on the French defendant and how a judgment of the English court would be enforced against the French defendant. I'll now back, hand back to Kirsten, who's going to talk about the first of these points, namely how Blue Toys might become aware of the infringement in the UK. Thanks, Gina. So, how might um, we become aware of the infringements? There are a number of tools available to brand owners to detect infringements of their intellectual property. One of the most popular and most efficient is the filing of an application for action, known as an AFA, with customs. The filing of an AFA puts customs on notice of your intellectual property rights so that customs can enforce those IP rights at the relevant border. Before the end of the transition period, Blue Toys may have registered its EUTM with customs for an EU-wide AFA to enforce the rights at the external border of the EU. If the infringing diesel product was being imported from China to the Netherlands, then the customs authorities in the Netherlands should be seizing the goods when they arrive. Similarly, the goods arriving from China into the UK should also be seized by UK customs. This is an efficient way for Blue Toys to detect and deal with infringement. But will this useful tool still be available to Blue Toys after the end of the transition period? It is likely that Blue Toys, as a German business, would have filed their EU-wide AFA with the customs authorities in Germany. If Blue Toys rights are already protected by an AFA made through an EU27 member state, they will not continue to be protected in the UK from the 1st of January 2021. In this case, Blue Toys would have to make a new application for a UK AFA using the new UK application form and procedure. For those of you with clients that have filed their AFAs in an EU27 member state, and who want to continue their protection in the UK, we would be happy to assist with the filing of UK AFAs on your client's behalf. If, on the other hand, Blue Toys have filed their EU-wide AFA with the custom authorities in the UK, 
what will the position be? The UK government will recognise existing applications of AFAs where the original application was handled by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. So Blue Toys AFA will be stored on a UK register after the transition period and Blue Toys can continue to seek enforcement in the UK until their AFA expires and there is no requirement to resubmit an existing application whilst it is still valid. What about the remaining part of Blue Toys EU-wide AFA that relates to the EU27? Will the shipments of diesel from China to the Netherlands be stopped? If Blue Toys original EU-wide AFA was filed through the UK, then it will be revoked for the EU27 at the end of the transition period. In this case, Blue Toys would have to file a new EU AFA through an EU27 customs authority. If the original AFA was filed in an EU27 territory, then the remaining part of the EU AFA will remain valid in respect of the remaining EU27 member states. As a final word on AFAs, you may know EORI numbers have been introduced. So what is an EORI number? Well, EORI stands for Economic Operators Registration and Identification Number. Businesses wishing to trade must use the EORI number as an identification number in all customs procedures when exchanging information with customs administrations. All IP rights holders and legal representatives will need an EORI number to either amend an existing AFA or to file a new one. Both IP rights holders and legal representatives will need separate UK and EU EORI numbers for filing and amending their respective UK and EU27 AFAs. Legal representatives cannot apply for EORI numbers on behalf of IP rights holders, but they can assist and we would be happy to assist your clients so they can get a UK EORI number. We'll now hand back to Gina. So, I expect many of you will be familiar with this by now, so I'm going to cover it very briefly. In summary, EU unitary rights will cease to have effect in the UK from IP completion date. However, comparable UK only rights will be created automatically. Applications for EU unitary rights which have not been granted by IP completion day, there'll be a nine month grace period in which the applicant can apply for an equivalent UK right and that right will have the same filing date, same priority date, same seniority date as the EU application. So in our scenario, Blue Toys EUTM for Fizzle will cease to apply in the UK as of the 1st of January. However, they'll automatically get a comparable UK trademark for Fizzle, with the same filing date as the EUTM, which can be enforced in the UK. Likewise, the existing EUTM can continue to be enforced in respect of the infringement in the EU27. The other thing to say though, is that when you're considering infringement issues in the UK, don't just think about the comparable UK rights that will have been created, but there are also other existing UK specific rights. So obviously UK trademarks and UK registered designs, but also the whole suite of unregistered rights. So passing off copyright, UK unregistered design right. In respect of UK unregistered design right, this has a different duration and scope to the EU unregistered design right. And as, a, as an aside, that, that EU unregistered design right will persist in UK law as continuing unregistered design in respect of EU unregistered design right, which um, it exists prior to IP completion day and supplementary unregistered design in respect of new rights which come into existence after IP completion day. Anyway, um, for the reason that the UK unregistered design right has a different duration and scope, always worth considering as an additional right to enforce in the UK, in particular if the short-lived EU unrestricted right or its comparable uh, rights in the UK have expired. There's obviously much more which can be said in respect to the rights that your clients will potentially be able to enforce in the UK after IP completion day, but that would be the basis for a talk in and of itself. If you do therefore have any questions, please feel free to get in touch and we'd be very happy to discuss the position with you further. I'll now pass back to Kirsten, who's going to discuss some of the considerations on use and reputation, which will arise in respect of comparable UK trademarks. Thanks, Gina. 
So we've looked at what rights we may enforce. We need to pause to consider whether there's any issues of use and reputation. These are obviously familiar concepts to those of us who work enforcing trademarks. How will they come into play in our scenario? As Gina explained, the EUTM for Fizzle will have been cloned at the end of the transition period into a comparable UK trademark. The cloned UK mark will have the same registration date as the original EUTM. So if Blue Toys were looking to enforce their rights in May 2021, when they become aware of the infringement, their trademark will have been registered for more than five years. As such, Green Toys are very likely to counterclaim that the trademark is vulnerable to revocation on the basis of non-use. Blue Toys will obviously be looking to stop Green Toys infringing activities both in the UK and in the EU27. So what is the position on showing genuine use of your mark in each of these cases? Taking the cloned UK mark first, at the time they discover Green Toys infringing acts in the UK, the cloned UK mark has not been used in the UK. However, use in the EU up to the 31st of December 2020 will be taken into account when assessing the use that has been made of a UK cloned right. So as Blue Toys mark has been widely used in the EU27 up to 31st December 2020, the use made in those countries will be taken into account. This means that the UK cloned right cannot be revoked for non-use, even though the mark has never been used in the UK, until after 31st December 2025. In other words, five years after the use in the EU27 stops being taken into account. And what about the remaining EU27 mark? Well, in our scenario, there's no issue because Blue Toys have used their mark extensively in the EU27. But what if that was not the case? Use in the UK counts as use in the EU up until 31st December 2020. So if Blue Toys instead had an EUTM that they had only used in the UK, what then would the position be? Assuming such use in the UK was substantial enough to maintain the EUTM before the end of the transition period, then after 31st December 2020, the UK use can be relied on and the EUTM cannot be revoked until after the 31st of December 2025, again, five years after the UK use stops being taken into account. So what about reputation? In our scenario, can Blue Toys rely on the extended protection afforded to mark with a reputation? Based on the extensive use made of the EUTM in the EU27 before 31st December 2020, the comparable cloned UK mark will be cloned as a mark with reputation, but there will have to be use in the UK after that date to keep the reputation alive. Otherwise, over time, that reputation will diminish. By the time Blue Toys looks to assert its mark in the UK in March 2021, the mark will still be considered to have a reputation. However, unless the mark is used after the end of the transition period in the UK, it's unlikely the position would be the same in 2024, for example. By that time, it's likely the reputation would have diminished to a level that is not afforded protection. And what would be the position of the remaining EU27 EUTM? The EUTM must have a reputation in the EU27 on the date the decision is taken. UK use will not be taken into consideration. So in respect of reputation, the position as between the UK and the EU27 after the end of the transition period is asymmetrical. Gina will now talk to you about considerations of where to bring an action. Okay, so as you appreciate from what I said earlier, with effect from IP completion day, EU unitary rights will cease to have effect in the UK. So what that means is that the UK courts will no longer have jurisdictions to hear new actions for infringement of EU unitary rights. So you're not going to get a pan-European injunction from the UK courts anymore. Likewise, any pan-European injunction granted by an EU 27 court will no longer include the UK. So you're going to have to tackle infringement in the UK and the EU separately. This could give rise to strategic considerations to the extent there is divergence in the law between the UK and EU. 
and we'll go on to discuss this in some detail shortly. If the law is more favourable in the UK as a result of that divergence, then you might want to bring proceedings in the UK first, because if the infringer has to change its branding here, practically speaking, it might also change it in the EU27 or vice versa. And so you might still have achieved what is no longer possible to achieve through the courts, that is relief throughout the EU27 and the UK. But before we move on to discuss the possibility for divergence in the law, we should mention one of the points which arises out of the scenario. There, Blue Toys only discovers in 2021 that Green Toys had been infringing its rights since 2020. It's therefore in a position of having to bring an infringement action in 2021 in respect of infringement which took place in 2020. And therefore the infringement sort of bridges the end of the transition period and the sort of brave new world that we enter next year. We understand that the UK courts will deal with this scenario by treating the claim as if it were the comparable UK right which had been infringed, even though the right which was actually infringed in 2020 was the EU unitary right. What this means is that the English court's determination on validity and infringement and the remedies it's able to grant in those UK proceedings brought by Blue Toys will be limited to the UK. Turning then to the issue of the potential for divergence in UK and EU law. The UK has retained all EU statute and case law, which was in effect on the 31st of December 2020. This body of EU law will consequently become part of the law of England and Wales from IP completion date. In the context of IP, it's the decisions of the CJEU which interpret relevant EU regulations and directives, which are relevant here. Of course, those were already binding on the UK courts due to the supremacy of EU law. The fact of retained EU case law should therefore simply ensure that the position on IP completion day remains the same as it was on the 31st of December 2020. Where it gets interesting is that the UK courts will no longer be bound to follow new EU case law or statute law, which is created on or after IP completion day. So in this respect, UK law will start to evolve and diverge from EU law, potentially relatively quickly. But what about deviation from retained EU case law? Well, there's provision for the UK courts to deviate from this in accordance with the rules of precedent. In this regard, it started off that it would only be the Supreme Court, which is England and Wales' highest court, which could depart from retained EU case law. However, following a further act of Parliament from this year and a consultation, it's now being confirmed that the Court of Appeal will also have the power to depart from retained EU case law. We think this decision to extend the ability of the courts to deviate from retained EU case law shows that there's an appetite for deviation within the government. Furthermore, the English judiciary has made no secret of its frustration in IP cases in particular trademark cases, at sometimes being bound by what it considers to be unclear and illogical jurisprudence from the CJEU. We therefore anticipate that there will also be an appetite within the judiciary for divergence from retained EU case law in a number of areas. There is some cap on the court's ability to deviate, as they will still be bound by domestic so what this means is that where a CJEU decision has been applied by the UK courts before, the UK courts will still be bound by that UK decision in accordance with the ordinary rules of precedent, so lower courts being bound by high decisions of higher UK courts. This means that the case might need to make it to a higher court before it's possible to deviate from established principles. As such, where we think we might see changes quickest in respect of deviation from existing EU case law, is where there's a CJEU decision which has never been applied by a UK court. An example is the line of EU cases which say that debranding, or the removal of a trademark from a product, amounts to an infringement. As far as we are aware, these cases have never been applied by the English courts, and so there would be, appear to be some freedom now for the English courts to reach a different view. There'll of course be many other examples. Turning now to the next slide. Uh, 
I'm going to talk to you here briefly about some of the features of English litigation on the basis that we think your clients may now be involved in English litigation perhaps more than they, they have to date, given that it's going to be um, not possible anymore to bring proceedings in an EU 27 territory and obtain a pan-European injunction which covers the UK. As, as we've already said, we think it's likely that infringement will need to be dealt with separately in the UK and the EU 27. There are many preconceived notions about English litigation, principally that it's very expensive. And certainly, you know, we are all aware that it is more expensive, or at least historically has been more expensive than equivalent infringement proceedings in other EU 27 countries. However, the English courts are well aware of this and have introduced a number of measures to try and address the issue. These include the shorter trial scheme and the flexible trial scheme, which are schemes which were available in the High Court, and also the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court, which is an alternative court to the High Court and has simplified procedures with a view to keeping down the cost of litigation. The aim of all these measures is to achieve shorter and earlier trials at reasonable and proportionate cost. And the idea between, behind of introducing them was also to try and foster a change in litigation culture recognising that comprehensive disclosure and a full oral trial on every single issue is often not necessary for justice to be achieved. The intention is very much that this will lead to significant savings in the time and cost of litigation. There are differences between the shorter trial scheme and the flexible trial scheme. The main ones being that the shorter trial scheme, as, it, as the name suggests, is all about achieving dispute resolution within a commercial time scale. So trial within 10 months, judgment within six weeks. Conversely, the flexible trial scheme is more about the parties devising their own case management procedures, which simplify and expedite the procedures that you would have in a sort of normal full high court trial. The IPEC, as I've said, is an alternative court altogether. And it has its own simplified procedures. Um, there are a number of differences between the IPEC and the High Court cases, but the main one I want to mention today is in respect of financial recovery. In the High Court, the unsuccessful party is usually entitled to recover around 65 to 75% of its legal fees from the unsuccessful party. However, in IPEC, that recovery is capped at £50,000, even if the party has spent significantly more than that. Likewise, in respect of the damages or account of profits which may be awarded, this is unlimited in the High Court, but capped at £500,000 in IPEC, though the parties can agree to waive that cap. In essence, though, these caps on financial recovery in IPEC are intended to offer litigants a way of limiting their financial exposure in litigation. And this kind of break to encourage litigants to take, to take a punt, have a go in borderline cases. The only other point on the slide that I'd like to specifically mention is that the UK is well known for its specialist judges, particularly, well not particularly, but including in IP. Um, and it's also known for those judge, judges producing robust judgments, um, which can have persuasive value in other territories. So this can be another thing to think about when forum shopping as between the UK and EU27. Of course, perhaps not in cases where there has been a significant divergence in the law, because then obviously the UK judgment would have less persuasive effect in the E27. I'll now hand over to Kirsten, who's going to talk about issues of service and enforcement of judgments against EU27 defendants from the 1st of January next year. Thanks, Gina. So, We've considered our rights and the best jurisdictions in which to bring our claim. So if we may go back to our scenario, if we assume that Blue Toys will issue a claim against Green Toys in the UK, how would they serve that claim on the defendant, Green Toys SA, who's based in France? The EU service regulation will be withdrawn at the end of the transition period, and the previously well-established methods of service under the EU regulation will not be available to parties in the EU 27 or the UK. Instead, service will be covered by the Hague Service Convention. While the Hague Service Convention is similar to the EU service regulation, it is not as modern and is likely to be less efficient and therefore more expensive. Importantly, 
the parties will need to check in advance whether a specific receiving state has made any declarations and reservations, as the position across the EU27 will not necessarily be consistent with each individual member state being able to set the declarations and reservations as they want for each um, of, on their own basis. What then if Blue Toys are successful in suing Green Toys for infringement in the UK, but Green Toys continue to infringe, ignoring the injunction granted by the English court? How would the judgment be enforced? As the proceedings against Green Toys would have been started in 2021, after the end of the transition period, then the enforceability of the English judgment depends on the local rules of each EU27 country. As such, the assistance of local council for the enforcement of such judgments could be required. And with that, I will hand back to Gina on exhaustion. Okay, so turning then to exhaustion, which is a standalone topic, which isn't covered by the scenario we have been discussing, but is something that's going to change following IP completion day. So rights which were exhausted in the UK and EU, EU before IP completion day will remain exhausted in both of those places after IP completion day. After IP completion day, however, there is going to be an asymmetry between the UK and EU exhaustion regimes. Rights which are exhausted in the EEA after IP completion day will remain exhausted in the UK, but the same is not true in reverse. So rights which are exhausted in the UK will not be exhausted in the EEA. This means that it will be possible to export goods from the EEA into the UK without the risk of infringing any UK rights. But goods exported from the UK to the EEA risk infringing EU rights. This position may change if the UK and the EU enter into a trade deal, because it seems to be um, really a sort of political issue um, and a sort of political rationale for having agreed this sort of asymmetric position, or sort of rather not agreed, but sort of it, the governments of uh, the two territories having decided to sort of impose this asymmetric regime. Obviously, there's a lot in the press at the moment about the trade deal. Um, I think it's looking probably quite unlikely that we will get one. And so we expect that this may be a position that we are all faced with for some time to come. So if we imagine an alternative scenario where green toys is parallel importing fizzle from the Netherlands into the UK, in that scenario, Blue Toys will not be able to stop those parallel imports in the UK because their rights will still be exhausted in the UK. However, if we see parallel imports from the UK into, say, the Netherlands, then Blue Toys will be able to exert their IP rights in the EU27 to try and stop those imports in that direction. Um, it's probably quite unlikely in reality that we will see much parallel import from the UK into the EU27 because the UK is such an expensive territory. Um, certainly in respect of pharmaceutical products, we understand that this is very unusual. Um, perhaps the position will be different in respect of other products um, and, it, and certainly in respect of um, you know, any products which do come into the UK and from there into the EU27. Um, we would hope that this would be um, a good opportunity for your clients who have EU rights to um, try and deal with that activity. Fortunately, the same won't be true for our, our clients in the UK. Um, that's what I proposed to say on exhaustion. So I'll hand back to Kirsten so she can conclude our talk with a look at what the future might bring. OK, so looking forward. We hope that you have found our consideration of this scenario and the issues that may arise at the end of the transition period an interesting and informative presentation. We'd be happy to discuss any of the issues covered with today with you. We believe that the end of the transition period should be viewed as positively as possible and that we should look for increased opportunities for cross-referral of enforcement work between the UK and the EU27 member states. Over time, the position in the UK and the EU27 will change and by having strong relationships between enforcement specialists, we will all be able to stay up to date on the changing position 
and provide the best possible advice to our clients. As a final point, I would mention that all the new comparable marks that are going to be added to the UK trademark register on the 1st of January 2021 will require a UK address for service. If any of you have clients that are worrying about this, we would be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you all for joining us. Goodbye.